Last year, around this time, I think, we talked about Judaism versus Christianity. And so now we want to do kind of like a sequel and to Judaism versus Islam. You know, we've, we've spoken about Christianity here and there on a number of occasions, but we haven't really said much about the other great Abrahamic faith, the other one of the big three, which is Islam. So now we want to turn our attention to Islam. And just like I did before, I have to make a disclaimer, just like I made in the Christian video. And the disclaimer is, of course, that this is meant to be strictly educational and not meant to be disrespectful, God forbid, or insulting. And we want to do this with, uh, with sensitivity. And I know there could be Muslims listening to this on the internet, and the idea is that this is meant to be done very respectfully, and it's not meant to insult anyone. It's just meant to be an open discussion and to provide a Jewish perspective on Islam. And Judaism in general is actually very respectful of Islam more so than Christianity, because in Jewish literature and our Jewish sages referred to a lot of aspects of Christianity are idolatrous, and there's a debate if Christianity is truly monotheistic or not. Uh, Catholicism in particular you know, has various Id idolatrous overtones, so our sages debated whether Christianity should be considered really monotheistic or whether it's a form of idolatry. Whereas with Islam, there's no doubt that it's not idolatry. Muslims are very strictly monotheistic. And so that has applications in Jewish law. Because in Jewish law, technically, a Jew is forbidden from entering a church. Because a church is considered like a place of idolatry. But a mosque is not considered a place of idolatry. And a Jew is allowed to enter a mosque. In fact, according to some opinions, a Jew is even allowed to pray in a mosque. So you're not allowed to pray in a church. You're not allowed to even visit a church, although there are some nuances there. There are situations where you might be allowed, and it depends on the type of church. And, but, but generally speaking, as a general rule, a Jew should not go into a church because of the doubt of whether that place is truly monotheistic or not, and among other reasons. You know, you go to, you know, to Europe and you want to, it's like a museum. Yeah, so if you go for historical, that's right. If you go for historical reasons, then... Even that is generally forbidden. But let's say you were doing it strictly for, you're a historian doing it strictly for historical reasons, perhaps you might be able to go when it's open for like the public and not during an actual okay, so service or something. Question. Yeah. When the king, Charles, yeah. got coroned, was right. there like a, a Muslim and Jewish? Yes, like, yes. That, those are that situations, like that's right. Rabbi, right. That's a situation where you are allowed to go. Oh, okay. Because that's a matter of, of that's a public event, and it's a matter of if he wouldn't go, he would be disrespecting the crown and the country, and so that's a different story. So generally speaking, a Jew shouldn't go into a church, but is fully allowed to go into a mosque, and is even, according to some opinions, allowed to pray in a mosque. So Judaism is actually very respectful of Islam. There's even another interesting question. You know that, halakhically, when a Jew is praying, the Amida, you're not allowed to walk in front of him. And I want to emphasize this rule because I see in our shul that this is being transgressed. Okay, and it's very annoying. So the law is that if somebody's praying the Amidah, that's a very high form of prayer. And the divine presence is said to be in front of a person who's praying the Amidah. So when a Jew is praying the Amidah, the divine presence is in front of the person. And you're not allowed to walk in front of them, ideally, for Amot four cubits, which is about eight feet. So you shouldn't walk in front of them eight feet. So if you, let's say you finish the Amidah early and you need to, let's say, go to the bathroom or something, then perhaps walk behind them or something like that. But you shouldn't walk in front of them eight feet because you're getting in their spiritual space. So now there's an interesting question. What if a Muslim is praying? Is a Jew allowed to walk in front of a Muslim? From a Jewish perspective, not, from, not in Muslim law. In Jewish law, is a Jew allowed to walk in front of a Muslim who's praying? And so again, there are different opinions on this, but one of the great rabbis of the late 1800s, the Maharil Diskin, Rabbi Yoshua Leib Diskin, he moved to Jerusalem and he spent the last 20 years of his life in Jerusalem. So he, he interacted with Muslims a lot. And he was asked this question. And he said that if a Muslim is praying from Jewish law, you are forbidden to walk in front of him, just like if it was a Jew praying the Amidah. Because the divine presence. No, they have their prayer. Yeah. 
They have their Muslim prayer. God is supposed to be. That's right. So the Maharil Diskin said that the, the divine presence is before them as well. Because ultimately they're praying to the same God, the same creator God. So that's just to highlight that Judaism is actually very respectful of Islam in general. Okay? And, and for me in particular, also personally, having been born in a Muslim country, I was born in what is today Uzbekistan, as you know, back then was the USSR, and the culture, my culture, the Bukharian Jewish culture, is very much influenced by and mixed with Muslim culture and has a lot of that um, Muslim, Arabic, Turkic, Farsi mix, <laughs> okay, and, and Bukhara as well is a very important place in Islamic history uh, because, you know, Muslims have the Quran, of course, and then on top of the Quran, they have the Hadith because just like we have the Torah and the Talmud, we have the written Torah, and then we have an oral Torah, which is recorded in the Talmud and Midrash. Muslims have the same idea where they have the Quran, which is their written Torah, so to speak, their, their scripture, and then they have these oral traditions that were recorded later, which is the Hadith. And they have two main compilations of Hadith. Just like we have two Talmuds, they have two main compilations of Hadiths. And one of them is the Hadith Bukhari, which was composed by a Bukhari in, in, in Bukhara, which is also where I'm from, where my ancestors are from. So uh, Bukhara was a major world city you know, in the 8th, 9th, around that time, centuries. One of the largest cities in the world and a center of Islamic scholarship. And so for me personally as well, uh, my own culture is very similar to some Muslim cultures. So that's why I just wanted to, to make that clear that we're doing this with, with great respect for Islam. And we don't mean this to be insulting. But how can you say it's close to Muslim culture? There's, Muslim culture is made up of thousands of different types of cultures. So I yeah, I'm saying like the I'm overarching... Your culture is Islamic culture. It's not. I'm saying it's, it's mixed together. In terms of our, our, our manner, you know, that Asian Middle Eastern hospitality, in terms of food, in terms of dress, in terms of temperament, perhaps, in ter a, a lot of things, yeah. So that's what I mean. Not like the religious side of it, right, but the right. cultural side of Middle Eastern uh, Muslim-inspired culture. That's what I mean. So... That said, you know, we recognize that Muslims are, we say, and they also don't disagree, that they come from Ishmael, the son of Abraham, and Ishmael is the half-brother of Yitzhak. So it's important to remember that. And we're both very strictly monotheistic, and so probably the two most strict monotheistic religions are Judaism and Islam. And so that's wanted to make that clear before we start. And superficially, Judaism and Islam seem very similar, because we have a lot, kind of like similar rules. We don't the abstaining from pork and then having other food laws like they have halal and we have uh, kosher and then circumcision of course Jews and Muslims circumcise and they have their law the Sharia law and we have halacha and that separates us from Christianity because Christians believe that you are redeemed and saved simply by your faith essentially through God's grace uh, as long as you have faith then God saves you through his grace and you don't need to observe the law that's the Christian view. But the Jewish view, like the Muslim view, is no, you have to fulfill God's law. You can't do whatever you want. And so for Muslims, that's Sharia law. And for Jews, we have halacha, and you have to fulfill God's law. Right? So that's, that's another similarity between Judaism and Islam. Having said that, though, at our core, which we discussed recently, Judaism is more similar to Christianity uh, because there's only two religions in the world that are based on the Tanakh, that are directly based on the Tanakh, which is Judaism and Christianity. Jews and Christians are the only two that actually hold to the original scriptures, the Word of God, the Tanakh, the Torah, and the prophets. So you walk into any church and you'll find what they call an Old Testament, and you'll walk into any synagogue and you'll find the Tanakh. But if you walk into a mosque, you won't find it a Tanakh or an Old Testament because Muslims believe that the Tanakh has been corrupted and the Quran is the final you know, revelation of God. So there's, you know, the Old Testament and then Christians created the New Testament and then Islam and the Quran is the final testament. That's how they call it. Okay, so they actually, so while Jews and Christians both accept scripture as the word of God, the Muslims don't. Although they derived their tradition from the Tanakh, of course, they believe in the same people, in the same patriarchs, Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, you know, Yes, 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 exactly. The Quran speaks about all these people. They just call them in Arabic, Ibrahim, Ishaq, right, Yaqub, and, and Daud, and all just different names. Yes, yes, it's similar stories, which we're going to get to, which we're going to get to. 
Uh, that's what we need to discuss. Yeah. So Muslims in general hold that the Tanakh was corrupted, and we'll see why, because there are discrepancies with the Quran. And so they believe that the Quran is the true word of God. And, you know, Jews and Christians believe that, of course, the language of creation, the language of scripture, the word of God is in Hebrew. Hebrew is a divine language. But Muslims think that Arabic is the divine language, right, and not, not Hebrew. So that's another major difference. Same thing with our prayers. Right? You walk into a church, a Baptist church in the southern U.S., and you're going to see people singing psalms and singing hallelujah and you walk into an ultra orthodox synagogue in Bnei Brak in Israel and people are singing psalms and singing hallelujah right so Jewish and Christian prayers are a lot more similar than Jewish and Muslim prayers right so Christian prayers and Jewish prayers are heavily based on 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 psalms on Tehillim in fact I'll tell you a story when I was uh 19 I think I went on birthright and you know you go on birthright, and then you can extend your trip. So you can stay in Israel for a little longer and visit your family. So I went. I was with my cousin, and we extended the trip. And my aunt, uh, God bless her, she, she, she booked a bunch of tours for us to do in those extra two weeks. And she booked it through a Russian, you know, she's Russian-speaking, so she booked it through a Russian uh, agency. I don't know if it was a Christian, like or, or Eastern Orthodox agency, or that they catered to Christians. But no, they were, she booked a bunch of great tours for us, like day tours, which were really nice. But one of them happened to be, and I don't think she like read the fine print. I think she just bought like a pack of tours. And one of them was a tour of Israeli, of churches and monasteries in Israel. <laughs> so my cousin and I come to the bus stop in Tel Aviv and we like we don't know what's happening right and uh we get our pass and we come on the bus and it's like a bus full of like elderly Russian Orthodox very religious Russian Orthodox Christian women with big crosses and we're like okay um (laughs) so we ended up going on this tour and like literally the whole the whole day going across the country going into like every major church and monastery uh, in Israel, <laughs> so it was quite educational. Uh, and no, but one thing, one thing that I found is, I mean, this is one of the things where one thing that I discovered is the similarity in terms of things like prayers. And one thing that really blew me away is, you know, we do the kedusha, right? In our prayers, we do the kedusha, where you know we raise our feet and we say kadosh, 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 right? Hashem tzvaot, all that. And hearing this blew me away because what they were doing, they, they were literally were saying the Kedusha, but in Latin. Like, I, I hear them going, Sancto, Sancto, Sancto. You know, they just, like, translated the Kedusha into Latin. That's exactly and was, just translated. That's right, that's right. So that's what I'm saying. And then there's similarities, like, Kaddish was the basis of the Christian, what they call the Lord's Prayer. So that's why I mean when I say that Judaism and Christianity have a lot more core similarities, right? And, and, and Christianity was born in Israel and was created by Jews living in Judea. Whereas Islam wasn't, as we'll see. Islam came from Arabia and was not actually produced by Jews. But we'll have to refine that because we'll see how influential a role Jews actually played in the rise of Islam. So it's going to be really surprising, I I guarantee you. Uh, But yeah, I think just to summarize the difference between like Judaism, Christianity and Islam is you just look at who we associate, which biblical figure we associate with each religion. Right From our perspective, we say that the Christian world is Esav. And we are Jacob, Israel, and Jacob and Esau are twins. Whereas the Muslim world we say is Ishmael. So Ishmael is like a half uncle. Whereas Esau and Yaakov are twins. Right? So that's why I think that summarizes it well. Whereas Yaakov and Esau are a lot closer in their core values. Although superficially, Judaism and Islam are more similar. Okay, let's get into, after that long introduction, into Islam. Let's try to understand it. Islam emerged in the 7th century in Arabia. So we have to set up what was Arabia like? Why did Islam emerge? What was Arabia like in the 500s, in the 600s, in the 400s that led to the the rise of Islam? And it's something really amazing because in the 400s, 500s, Arabia was very heavily Jewish. There were a lot of Jews in the Arabian Peninsula. Why? Why were there a lot of Jews in the Arabian Peninsula? Because? economic opportunity, but mostly for safety. Because remember, you have Rome in the West, the Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire, which came out of Rome, the Eastern Roman Empire. And then on the other side, you have the Persian Sasanian Empire. And these two empires were constantly fighting each other. The Romans and the Persians were like these huge enemies of each other. And also they were both persecuting Jews. 
So Jews didn't have it easy in the Roman Empire, and they didn't have it easy in the Persian Empire. In fact, our sages debate in Masechet Gitin, they, they debate, where is it better to live? Which suffering is worse? Is suffering under the Romans worse, or is suffering under the Persians worse? And there's a story there on page 17 where the sages are learning, and one of the Persian authorities comes in and shuts off, puts out all their fires, and the room goes dark because it was a Persian fire worshiping festival and whatever, and you weren't allowed to have fires or whatever it was. And so these Jewish sages who were learning, suddenly it's dark and they're really upset. And one of them said, Rachamana, God, please, O betolach, O betula davav esav. So either place us in your shadow directly, either you rule over us, or let us be ruled by Esav, by Rome. Let us live in Rome, because we're sick of living in the Persian Empire. And then the, the rabbis go into a debate, but really, is Rome better than Persia? Isn't the Roman uh, persecution much worse than the pers- Persian persecution? And there's a debate there, a fascinating debate. But ultimately, both were terrible. And the Ben Ishai says something interesting there. He says, one, the, the difference is that for Talmidei Chachamim, for the religious scholarly Jews, it's better to live in Rome. But for the average simple Jew, the non-religious Jew and the non-learned Jew, it's better to live in Persia. And the reason is because if you remember the blessing that Yitzchak gave Yaakov and Esav, Yitzchak told Esav, you know, that your brother will be greater than you. But when he goes off the derech, you know, Esav will be allowed to punish him, but only if he goes off the derech. So the Ben Ishchai says that that's why the religious Jews, it's easier for them to live in the Roman Empire because they're not off the derech, and so Esav has no permission to persecute them. But for the secular Jews who are not religious, then Esav does have permission to persecute them. And so that's why for them, it would be better to live in Persia. Whereas for scholars, it would be better to live in, for the religious, the scholarly class, it would be better to live in Rome. Make sense? That's how the Ben Ishchai concludes it. Because there's a rule in the Torah when, when Isaac, when Yitzhak blessed his children, he, he, there's, he told Esav that Yaakov will be greater than you and he will kind of be more influential. But when he is not so religious, you will be able to suppress him. And then you will be, God will use you almost as an agent to punish him, something like that. Mm-hmm. And so that's why the Ben Ishai says, that's why Jews who are not religious it's better for them to live in Persia because in Rome, they have permission to be persecuted, essentially, spirit, from a spiritual perspective, whereas Rome doesn't have the power to persecute the religious Jews. Whether that's factually true or not, historically, yeah, whether that's historically factual or not, it's hard to decide because Jews have been suffering everywhere and, and religious Jews haven't been spared. But that's what the Ben Ishai says. The point is that Jews suffered in Persia and in Rome. So where do you go? I mean, the only place between Persia and Rome is Arabia, right? Between. And neither Persia or Rome held on to Arabia. It was very hard to, to maintain that territory. It's desert. There's not as so much going on over there. And so you have little oasis towns. And so neither was able to... They tried to conquer this territory, but couldn't. And so this Arabia... Is Zoroastrian, uh, yes, Persia? yes. This is pre-Islamic Zoroastrian <laughs> Persia. That's right. And so... Uh, neither empire really held on to Arabia. It was an independent place with small tribes, clans, kingdoms. And so Jews flocked there. And there was many Jews in Arabia. In fact, in the 400s, there was a king named Abu Kariba. And Abu Kariba was the king, that, was the king of a kingdom called Himyar, which is in what is today Yemen and southern Saudi Arabia. And he was going to fight the Byzantines. And on his way to battle, he stopped by a very Jewish city called Yathrib, which was founded by Jews. And we're going to come back to that city soon. It's a really important city. And he, he got really sick. And two rabbis from that city healed him. And then he was impressed. And then he ended up converting to Judaism. And his whole army converted to Judaism. And he came back and his kingdom converted to Judaism. So in the 400s, there was a very powerful Jewish king and kingdom in Saudi Arabia. And one of his successors, was named, his name was Dunawas. Dunawas literally means Lord Sidelocks because he had long peot. And he was also one of the great kings of pre-Islamic Arabia, and he was Jewish. And, also, and he actually allied at one point with Marzutra, one of the Torah scholars, one of the Talmudic scholars in the early 500s, or post-Talmudic scholars. And they sought to create, recreate a Jewish 
kingdom in Israel even. But he was defeated in the year 525 by an alliance of Byzantines and Ethiopians. They crushed the Jewish kingdom of Himyar. But the, the point is that Saudi Arabia or Arabia at that time was very heavily Jewish and there was even a powerful Jewish kingdom there. Uh, which was only defeated in the year 525. And Muhammad was born around the year 570, very shortly after. So in this time period, there was, Judaism was very hev- heavily present in Saudi Arabia. In fact, one of the great historians, French historian, Joseph Ernest Renan, this is his words, he said, only a hair's breadth pre- prevented all Arabia from becoming Jewish. You know, if it wasn't for, Mah- for Muhammad, eventually Arabia would have been entirely Jewish. So Muhammad was born in a very Jewish environment. There were also Christian communities there. And so he was exposed to many, many Jewish ideas. And he, so I'll talk a little bit about Muhammad. Uh, He was born to the clan called Banu Hashim. And he was an orphan. His dad died before he was born. His mother died as well when he was a child. And he was raised by grandparents. He was raised by the uncle, his uncle, who was the leader of this particular tribe and his uncle would take him on trading caravans to Syria and they say that that's when he met in uh, a Christian monk in Syria and started learning with a Christian monk he had been exposed to Jewish ideas as well in Arabia and then in the year 595 when he was maybe 25 years old he married an older woman a much older woman who was already uh, a widow and had her own children but she was very wealthy and her name was Khadija and he married her, and she became kind of like his financier and his support. So yeah, so he marries this older woman who kind of starts bankroll, who would later bankroll his initial operation, which is interesting. There's another parallel there to Christianity, because, you know, in, with the story of Jesus, you've heard of Mary Magdalene, and she's sometimes depicted as a prostitute or something, but that's kind of been rejected, even by Christians, that idea of Mary Magdalene as a prostitute. And people actually say she would have been more of like a wealthy woman who actually supported his movement financially. So there seems to be a pattern of like older, rich women supporting charismatic young men in starting new religions. Yeah. And so Muhammad would go pray in a cave near Mecca. And in the year 610, he received a vision from the angel Gabriel. Okay, Jibril, Gabriel in Gabriel in Hebrew. Allegedly, Allegedly that's, that's the story. I'm, I'm telling the, the story of Islam. Right? So in the year 610, he received this vision. And Gabriel showed him a cloth with parchment and told him to read. And he said, I can't read, I'm illiterate. And so Gabriel told him a second time, read. And he said, I can't read, I'm illiterate. And so the third time, the angel Gabriel started to recite to him. And he committed it to memory. And that presumably is the Quran that he committed to memory. But Muhammad himself was illiterate, and, but he committed the Quran to memory. Okay, so that's, that's the idea. Now, after that, uh, he stopped receiving visions for a while, and he had a really hard time dealing with it. And according to the story, he even tried to commit suicide a couple of times, and he wanted to jump off a cliff, and the angel Gabriel would come and save him. Uh, so, so he was really struggling with this, whatever these visions that he was seeing. And his wife believed in him and started to help to support him in spreading this somewhat new message, uh, which was somewhat new because it was based on Jude- Christianity and Judaism. It was spreading monotheism essentially to the pagan Arabs, who at that time were polytheists and believed in various gods and goddesses. And so his message was to end paganism and to bring true monotheism like Jewish monotheism, essentially, to pagan Arabia. Right? And he preached the whole idea of reward and punishment, monotheism, all that. And when he came to Mecca, Mecca was a pagan city, and he was opposed, very strongly opposed. And people said he was blaspheming. And, but he did, you know, the, in Mecca, there's the Kaaba, that big square. You've seen this, this big black square, and it has a stone inside, the black stone. And so that was always like a pagan place of worship in Arabia, even pre-Islam. That shrine existed even before Islam. And pre-Muslim Arabs, pagan Arabs, already performed that ceremony of circling the rock and kissing it and so on. And Muhammad did that to show the pagans that he wasn't so, you know, that he was still one of them, so to speak. But his message was one of monotheism. That black stone, by the way, is probably a meteorite. That's what scientifically what people say. 
So over the next decade, he was trying to spread this message. Didn't go particularly well for him. There was a lot of issues involved. He managed to get a small group of supporters. I'm skipping ahead in the interest of time. But in the years around 620, his wife, Khadija, she died. And so that was a big problem for him because she was a major source of funding and support. And his movement waned. And a couple of years later, he was actually kicked out of Mecca. In the year 622, he was completely expelled from the city. And he had only about 70, 75, 73, perhaps, male followers with him. And he had nowhere to go, but he was invited by a relative to Yathrib, this city that I mentioned earlier. Yathrib was a Jewish oasis town. It was founded by Jews, and it was controlled by three Jewish clans. And there were three Jewish clans that lived. There was, at, there was at least 20 Jewish clans in Arabia at the time, and the three main ones were called the Banu Kuraiza, the Banu Nadir, and the Banu Kainuka. And they controlled the city of Yathrib. And there were two newer pagan tribes that were trying to take over the city. And so the Jewish tribes, the Jewish clans, and the pagan ones were kind of in a dispute. And Muhammad's relative said, why don't you come and settle the, this, these disputes for them? And so they welcomed him in, apparently. And Muhammad came in and soon became kind of like the mayor of the city of Yathrib. This is in the year 622, and presumably he settled their disputes, and he was respected as one of the leaders of the city. And for Muslims, this is a major event in Islamic history because this is the point at which they begin their calendar. So the Muslim chronology, the Muslim calendar, actually begins in the year 622 with Muhammad's arrival in Yathrib, which they then renamed Medina. Medina being you know, the birthplace of the city, the birth city of Islam. So they actually start from then on, Islam really started to spread rapidly because now Muhammad had a base of operations. And from there, he started to do little raiding attacks on neighboring clans and appropriating a lot of wealth from that. And he started to spread, you know, spreading his message by the word didn't go so well. So at that point, he started to spread his message by the sword, which worked a lot better. And in fact, the Hadith, which I mentioned earlier, the Hadith actually says that he wasn't getting many supporters. And this is, I'm quoting directly from the Hadith, the other, not the Bukhari, the, the other Hadith, which says, Muhammad himself said, quote, if only 10 Jews would have followed me, every single Jew on earth would have followed me. Right. And another reading that I found, an alternative translation, if 10 scholars of the Jews would follow me, no Jew would be left upon the surface, surface of the earth who would not embrace Islam. So meaning he didn't get many supporters among the Jews, right? The Jews rejected him as a prophet because for them, he didn't really prophesy anything new. Like what? Yes, we know that there is one God and that there is reward and punishment. He had no really no new message for the Jews. And plus, we believe and know that the age of prophecy has long ended. Right? So uh, he was very he was frustrated with this, with this lack of support that he was getting from the Jews. Kind of like Paul, again, the New Testament, who was very, uh, you can see his frustration that the Jews would not accept his message. And, and Muhammad went through the same things. So he started spreading his message instead of by the word, by the sword. And there were a number of massacres of Jewish tribes. In 627, he massacred the Banu Kuraiza. And this is where things get really interesting. He beheaded 900 Jewish men, and then he enslaved every woman and child. And he took a wife for himself. One of the Jewish women, whose name was Rehana, Rehana, he wanted her and he married her, but she didn't want him. She refused to convert. And ultimately, we don't know what happened to her. Some say she became a slave again or that he freed her and she went back to live among the Jews. We don't know. But that was one of his Jewish wives was Rehana. So Rehana, not the singer Rehana, but there, there was a Jewish Rehana. Uh, 1400 years ago, who was Muhammad's first Jewish wife. But that relationship didn't last long. Two years later, he decimated another Jewish tribe, the Banu Nadir, uh, at the Battle of Kaibar. And over there, this time, he did get a Jewish wife. Her name was Sophia. And she be became one of the most important women in Muslim history. She was a Jewish woman that he enslaved, that another Muslim man uh, took her for himself. But Muhammad saw her, fell in love with her, and took her for himself. And she became one of what are called the mothers of Islam. So just like we have the mothers, the Ima'ot of Judaism, one of the mothers of Islam is this daughter of the rabbi of the Banu Nadir. Her name was Sophia. Muslims refer to her as Safiya bint Huyai, and she is one of the mothers of Islam. And she, but she didn't have any kids 
with Muhammad. And when she died, she left her entire wealth to her Jewish nephew. And Muslim tradition records that the other wives made fun of her because she was Jewish. And Muhammad reportedly told her, if they make fun of you, tell them that your father was the prophet Aaron and your uncle was Moshe, Moses. And that you should tell them, therefore, I am superior to you. That's what he told her to say. And they're both buried. Both of these Jewish wives are buried in Medina in what is today Saudi Arabia. What's it? No, he, not literally, not literally. He meant to say that your ancestors were Aharon and Moshe, so you're greater than these pagan Arab wives that I have. Right. What about the other wives? Like, there, they're all there. He had many wives. No, 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 yeah. they were the Jewish, they were white. Yeah, pagan, pagan Arab. Oh, just, yeah, yeah, now Muslim, now converted to Islam, yeah. And so, yeah, they're both buried in the cemetery close to where Muhammad is um, at the time in Medina. Okay, so, and then, so these were his two Jewish wives. And then, even more importantly, his main advisor was also a Jew, of course. So his name was Abdallah ibn Salam. Okay, he was, according to the Muslim legend, according to the Hadith, he was a rabbi, and the Hadith paints him as one of the great rabbis. And he apparently had a vision from God that God would send another prophet. And when Muhammad appeared in Medina in 622, he said, this is the one, this is the prophet according to the, the Hadith, okay? And the Hadith even says that he was so important that he was the first Muslim to go to heaven. So this Jew, Abdallah, Abdallah ibn Salam, the Hadith says he was the first Muslim to go to heaven. Um, and the, the story goes, the Hadith says, and this is in the Hadith Bukhari, it says that Muhammad asked his followers, do you want to see a man walking on earth and in paradise? And they all thought that he meant them, but he pointed to Abdallah, the Jew, and said, he's the one. Right? He, this Jew who became a Muslim was the first Muslim to go to heaven as a Muslim. That's from the Hadith, straight from the Hadith. And then another Hadith says that uh, when Muhammad came to Medina, Abdullah asked him three questions. And first, the, the, the nature of the questions isn't particularly important. We can skip over that. And, but Muhammad didn't know the answer at first. And then the angel Gabriel came to him again and told him the answer. Now, one of the things here that the Hadith says wrong about Judaism is that apparently Abdullah said that Jews uh, don't like the angel Gabriel and that Gabriel is somehow their enemy, which is not true. That's not what Jews believe. Jews believe that Gabriel is one of the main angels in heaven and one of our defenders. Right? So we have five main defending angels, and the acronym is Argaman, Argaman, like the dye, the purple dye. Aleph, Reish, Gimel, Mem, Nun. Aleph is Uriel, Reish is Raphael. Gimel is Gabriel, Mem is Michael, and Nun is Nuriel. So those are like the five defending angels of the Jewish people. So of course, G Gabriel plays an important role in our literature as well. He was the one that came and helped Yosef when he was in prison, and he came to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and so on. Gabriel plays a very important role. So this is, a, this is something that the Hadith gets wrong about Judaism. We don't consider Gabriel some kind of bad angel. We consider Gabriel one of our actual, our main angels. Okay. And now, so this is the Muslim version of the story of Abdullah, but the historical version is probably that he only converted in the year 630 after all those massacres and probably by force, not by choice. But in any case, he became an important advisor to Muhammad. And that's the historical version. Now, the Jewish version is where it gets really interesting. Okay. Now, buckle your seatbelt. Okay. So this is where it's going to get a little spicy. So before I get to that, just to finish off with Muhammad, he came back to Mecca in 630. He had at this point now 10,000 followers. And so he was very easily took over Mecca and it became his new base of operations. He died two years later. And from then on, the Muslim empire, Islamic, the original Islamic caliphate spread very quickly. And it was basically easy pickings because the Byzantines and the Persians were killing each other so much, they were both decimated. They decimated each other. So for Islam to come in, they basically just took over all of that stuff very quickly, right? All of North Africa and Israel and Syria from the Byzantines and the whole Middle East, essentially, from the Persian, the Sasanian Empire, which completely collapsed, right? So it was very, it was very quick. Um, okay. Muhammad did not write the Quran. 
Nobody says Muhammad wrote the Quran because like we said, Muhammad was an Ummi and he was illiterate. So he didn't write the Quran and Muslims don't believe that he did. But he recited it and presumably his followers memorized it and eventually wrote it down. Okay? And Muslims think that they wrote it down verbatim, word for word, but critics will say, of course, that it took several generations and it was heavily edited. Now, one thing for sure is that the Quran cites the Torah many times. And not just the Torah, but even the Midrash and the Talmud, for sure. The Quran clearly references Jewish literature all the time. Okay. So, for example, in Surah 5, chapter 5, verse 32, it quotes straight from the Talmud that we actually quoted recently. It says, Therefore, we ordained, meaning Allah ordained for the children of Israel, that he who slays a soul, unless it be in punishment for murder or for spreading mischief on earth, shall be as if he had slain all mankind. And he who saves a life shall be as if he had given life to all mankind. You remember that verse? That's straight from Sanhedrin. Remember we said in Sanhedrin that Sanhedrin says, Nivra Adam Yechidi, Adam was made as a one person, Lelamedcha, to teach you, Shekolame Nefesh Achat, anybody who kills one soul, Ma'ale Alav Akatuv, Ki'ilu Ibed Olam Male, it's as if he killed the entire world, all of mankind, Vecholame Kayem Nefesh Achat, and he who saves one soul, Ma'ale Alav Akatuv, Ki'ilu Kiem Olam Male. So somebody who saves a life, it's as if he saved the whole world, saved all of mankind. So the Quran is clearly quoting from the Talmud, which was published around the year 500, right? And it's quoting that Allah said this to the children of Israel. And so the Quran's clearly quoting something straight out of the Talmud. There's an even more intense one. In, in Surah 2, chapter 2, verse 187, it says, you know, when Muslims celebrate Ramadan, they don't eat during the day, but they're allowed to eat at night. So when is that time? At which point are they no longer allowed to eat? So you're allowed to eat at night, but not during the day. So, yeah, but when it, sunrise, but when is sunrise? Meaning at sunrise, you have to stop, at dawn, you have to stop eating. But when is that time? And the Quran says, it's, and I quote, eat and drink until the white thread of dawn becomes distinct to you from the black thread. So until you can differentiate between the white and black thread. Now, what does that mean, the white and black thread? It's a little ambiguous. But if you remember the Mishnah in Masachet Brachot, Right at the beginning of the Talmud, right at the beginning of the Mishnah. The second Mishnah in Masechet Brachot is, Me'imatai korin et shma b'shacharit. When do you say the Shema in the morning? Meaning, what's the earliest time you can say Shema? When is the dawn to say Shema? And the answer is, Mishayakir ben t'chelet lelavan. When you can tell the difference between blue and white in your tzitzit. Right? Because the tzitzit has a blue and white thread. So when you can tell the difference between blue and white, then that's when you're allowed to say Shema. Right? Make sense? You know what I'm talking about? You know the, pro the proper CC is blue and white, yeah? You know, you've seen this before? Here, I'll show you. Okay, that's what it's supposed to be, right? So when you can tell the difference between the blue and the white strings, then that's when you're allowed to say Shema. Okay? And meaning there's enough light? Yeah, that's right. Because that, they didn't have electric lights, meaning when it's bright enough outside to see between blue, the blue and white threads of your tzitzit, then you know you can say Shema. And the Quran is quoting this essentially, right? That's the start of dawn. It's quoting another Talmudic passage. How do Jews determine when is the start of dawn? When you can tell on your threads the difference between white and blue. But like, what does this mean to a Muslim that doesn't have tzitzit, right? So you can see how the Quran is quoting something from the Talmud that actually doesn't really apply because Muslims don't have these threads, right? And by the way, the distinction, the, the Quran says white and black and we have white and blue. But that's because actually a lot of ancient sources, a lot, ancient literature, they don't differentiate between black and blue. Uh, that's an interesting thing that you can look up. You know, ancient texts don't seem to mention blue, and they seem to use the word black for blue. So black and blue are often interchangeable in ancient texts. It says rarely black and white because of the Again? Is the Israeli black blue yes. and white? Yes, 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 that's right. That's right. Is it, is it because of Yeah, that's why the trellis is blue, because of the sapphire. The blue is supposed to resemble the sapphire throne, that's right, yes. And the flag of Israel is white and blue, because when they designed it, uh, they, want, they based it on the talit. Right? The talit was, was and, the, and the tzitzit is white and blue, yes, exactly. So that's just another example. Now, those are kind of uh, innocent, but then the Quran quotes from the Torah 
and is clearly confusing characters. Okay, now listen to this. This is something really interesting. The, Quor- the Quran says, <clears throat> I quote, Then she brought him to her people carrying him. They said, O oh Mary, you have certainly done a thing unprecedented. So it's talking about the Virgin Mary. Okay? Now, just as a side point, Muslims accept Jesus as Al-Masih, as the Messiah. Not as a God, but as the Messiah. Okay? So Muhammad accepted Jesus as the Messiah. As a prophet, yes, as one of the prophets, and as Al-Masih, as the Messiah. Okay? They, but they reject, this is where, where they say Christians corrupted, and they're right about this part, where they turn Jesus into a god, which is now idolatry. And so they don't accept Jesus, of course, as a god, and they don't believe in the whole resurrection thing, but they accept that Jesus was a prophet and the Messiah of the Jews. Okay? And they venerate Jesus, Isa, and Mary, M- Miriam. The Virgin Mary. So this is what this, the Quran says. Oh Mary, you have certainly done a thing unprecedented. It says this. Oh sister of Aaron, your father was not a man of evil, nor was your mother unchaste. So she pointed to him. They said, how can we speak to one who is in the cradle a child? Jesus said, indeed I am the servant of Allah. He has given me the scripture and made me a prophet. This is Jesus, the son of Mary. And then the other, another surah continues. And Mary, daughter of Imran, of Amram, whose body was chaste, meaning she was a virgin, right? We breathe therein something of our spirit. So God put his spirit, Allah put his spirit in Mary, and she brought forth Jesus, okay? Now, what's the problem with what I just said? They're saying that the virgin Mary was the daughter of Amram and the sister of Aaron. Do you see the problem with this? Of course. Yeah. The Quran is confusing Miriam, the sister of Aaron. Right, the virgin Mary, Mary is Miriam, right? In Hebrew, she's Miriam. So the Quran is saying that the Virgin Mary who gave birth to Jesus is the sister of Aaron and the daughter of Amram. Now that's of course impossible because those two events are a thousand and a half years apart. So this is completely impossible. And Muslims have a very hard time explaining this because how is this possible, right? Like how can the Quran, and there's no mistaking it because the Quran is clearly saying that she's the sister of Aaron and the daughter of Amram, of Imran, and she gave birth to Jesus. Oops. Yes. Which is bizarre. Like, how could this be well, a, in the Quran? Until they wrote it down, so that's why. But this is, something that's, this is something that's so basic knowledge, you would think, right? Like, any Jew or Christian would know this immediately, red flag, right? Which is perplexing. And I tried to get Muslim explanations for this. I actually did as much research as I could, and I could not find a satisfactory explanation. Ultimately, they just say, and this is where they have to say, that the Torah was corrupted, that the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Tanakh is corrupt, and the Quran's version is the authentic version. Or they'll say, other, they'll say that the Virgin Mary, also, her father was also named Amram, just like Miriam, the sister of Aaron. Was. So they'll, find, like, they'll try to find ways to explain it, but ultimately, I did not find... Uh, acceptable explanation that made sense. If any Muslim is listening to this and would like to send me one, I would love to see it. So, so why doesn't it make sense that she had another Abraham and another person with the same name as the Papa? Because the Virgin Mary's father was not Amram. And nor did she have a brother named Aaron. Why the Virgin Mary? To distinguish her from the other Marys. That's all. Just because there's two, there's two Miriams here. There's two Marys. Meaning, like, the, the Latinized Greek Are version... <laughs> Mary meaning Miriam. That's what I mean, of course. So the, 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 the Quran is calling her the Virgin Mary. The father okay. of, of Mary, the mother of... Her, her father was Yehoiakim. That's his name. In the, that's what Christians say in the New Testament. Okay, Yehoiakim? That was Yehoiakim, yeah. Yehoiakim. That's Yehoiakim. her name. The father of Mary. That's one example. Now, another thing, another confusing detail in the Quran. Surah 28 Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of the Exodus, the Pharaoh who enslaved the Jews. Pharaoh calls Haman, Haman, the oppressor of the Jews, to torment the Jews in Egypt. And now this is a huge problem, as you can see, because Haman of the Purim story lived again over a thousand years after the Pharaoh or about a thousand years after the Pharaoh of the Exodus. So the Quran seems to be putting the Pharaoh and Haman at the same time period, which is impossible. Then the, the Quran says that Pharaoh commissioned Haman to build a tower to heaven. And that's, of course, the story of Migdal Bavel, the Tower of Babel, which happened centuries before the Exodus. 
So now the Quran is combining plot lines from three different millennia, literally, literally from three different millennia into one story that Pharaoh commissioned Haman to build the tower to heaven. Again, I could not find a satisfactory answer f- to this. And there are others, by the way. I'm, I'm going to, if you want, I'll tell you more after. But these are two, the two big ones. And I have, I have several other examples of this, of the Quran confusing major details. And so no Jew or Christian could ever take it seriously. No educated Jew or Christian. Obviously, if you don't know any scripture, any basic history of the you know, tradition, the scriptural tradition, then fine. But if you know even basics, then how could you ever accept this? You can't. Which leads me to this discovery. You remember the Cairo Gniza? We talked about the Cairo Gniza. In Cairo, they found in the 1800s, uh, in the synagogue, you know, it's a Gniza, is where you throw, uh, where you put away Torahs, parchments, things that were written in Hebrew, things that might have names of God. Since you can't des- destroy holy scriptures, Gniza. you throw it in the Gniza. Yeah. No, Gniza. And the Cairo Gniza was unique in that they threw everything in there. Even like Hebrew practice papers from kids' schools, where the kids were learning Hebrew and were writing Hebrew letters. They didn't want to destroy that either. So anything Hebrew was thrown in there. And it's thousands and thousands and thousands of parchments and, and things and we even have, like we mentioned before, letters from the Rambam, letter, ra- handwritten contracts from the Arizal, like amazing things. And one of the things that was discovered in the Cairo Gniza is a fragment about Abdullah ibn Salam. Remember Abdullah, the Jew, Muhammad's main advisor? And this is what it says, something incredible. It says that Abdullah ibn Salam was converted by force. Him and his group of Jews, forcibly converted Jews, put together the Quran. Because who else would, right? The, the illiterate Arabs of the time, and this is, again, this is not an insult to the Arabs. They were mostly illiterate at the time. The Quran admits that. Muhammad admits that he was illiterate. So this is not, meant, this is not disrespectful to them. They say that. So among the pagan, these pagan Arabs that had converted to Islam, almost all of them were illiterate. So who would have really put together the Quran? Probably those Jewish scribes and scholars who were educated and literate. And so the Cairo Gniza fragment makes the case, and I'm not saying this is a historical fact, I'm just saying, and, and many people will say it's a forgery or whatever, but it's an interesting idea that explains to me a lot of this, that Abdullah ibn Salam and those Jews who had forcibly been converted to Islam deliberately put together the Quran in such a way that it has such obvious mistakes that nobody could ever take it seriously. To make sure the Jews don't buy That's right. To make sure that Jews and Christians as well, but Jews specifically, wouldn't, would know that this is not the word of God. In fact, there's an interesting theory there, which I'm not going to get to, but I can, I can link to a paper that looks at, the Quran has some mysterious letters sometimes, and Aleph, Alamed, Amem, and, and, and Muslims, within like the within the, the Arabic, Aleph, Lamed, Mem, they have a lot of the same letters. And, and Muslims don't know what they mean. They think it's some like Kabbalistic thing, some mystical thing that the Quran has. And so there's a paper that I found that argues that the, the Cairo Gniza mentions this, this text, that they deliberately, these Jewish sages, Abdullah ibn Salam and his Jewish quasi uh, cryptic, crypto-Jewish Muslim sages who put together the Quran, put those letters there on purpose at the beginning of multiple chapters because if you know what the letters Aleph, Lamed, Mem mean in Hebrew, then you'll know exactly what they were trying to say. And that's all I'm going to say. So you decide what you think about what putting those letters together in Hebrew, what but they mean. Quran about Jews? Many things, for sure. Yes. And uh, we'll, we'll get to a few of those. Yeah, yeah. yeah Mostly the Jews were delivered out of Egypt into yeah. the land of Israel. How's that for... Uh, yeah. They like their yeah. cookies. That's right. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, the Quran, the Quran says that God gave Israel to the Jewish people. Yeah. Uh, I'll read it for you. Surah, in Surah 5, it says, O people of the book, our messenger has indeed come to you, making things clear to you. So on, so I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, and Allah is most capable of everything. Remember when Moses said to his people, O oh my people, remember Allah's favors upon you when he raised prophets from among you, made you sovereign, and gave you what he had never given anyone in the world, 
O my people, enter the holy land which Allah has destined for you to enter. And do not turn back or else you will become losers. That is the translation. So the, the Quran admits that God gave the Israelites under Moses, the Jewish people, the people of the book, it says, right? That God gave the people of the book the land of Israel. And it's for them. And, and that yes. he, never, he never did anything like that before for anybody else. Just to come and answer exactly, the question that exactly. can't come and say. Yes. Give, no, because he never did the That's same right. Thing. The Quran clearly says he had never given anyone in the world something that he only did for us. So the Quran admits that Israel belongs to the Jewish people. So now ask yourself on the Arab-Israeli conflict why they won't. Exactly. That's a great question. There are a few yeah. honest imams. Oh, there are many. On my website, I have a whole list of imams and qadis and various sheikhs that are essentially Zionists that say, no, listen, the Quran says that the holy land, the land of Israel belongs to the Jews. You know? And Muslims later decided that Al-Quds is Jerusalem, that this place where from which Muhammad went up to heaven was that stone in Jerusalem, the Dome of the Rock, right, the st in Jerusalem. But there are, again, there are many Muslim scholars who say that's not possible, that Muhammad didn't go to Jerusalem, that Al-Quds is in Saudi Arabia, and that they've even determined where exactly Al that is. Al-Aqsa. Al-Aqsa. Al Good. Yeah, same idea. Al-Aqsa and Al-Quds meaning, you know, the, the holy place. Yeah, Al-Quds is the holy place. Al-Aqsa is, I think, the far place. So there's the near place and the far place. Yeah both been identified as being in essentially in in Saudi Arabia um, so and not but but today Muslims think that that Al-Aqsa and Al-Quds is Jerusalem you know or Al-Aqsa is in Jerusalem so but yeah that's not that wasn't the original tradition whatever the case uh, Islam arose for a reason it needed to, for sure, it needed to come about. If Islam came about, just like Christianity, it came about for a reason. God needed it to happen. And the Rambam, Maimonides, explains why. He starts by saying like this. And we, I quoted from this before. I'm going to read the whole thing. It's in the Mishnah Torah, which we discussed recently. Can there be a greater stumbling block than Christianity? All the prophets spoke of Mashiach as the Redeemer of Israel and their Savior who would gather their dispersed and strengthen their observance of the mitzvot. In contrast, Christianity caused the Jews to be slain by the sword, their remnant to be scattered and humbled, the Torah to be altered, and the majority of the world to err and serve a God other than Hashem, than the Lord. Nevertheless, the intent of the Creator of the world is not within the power of man to comprehend, for his ways are not our ways, nor are his thoughts our thoughts. Ultimately, all the deeds of Jesus of Nazareth and the Ishmaelite who arose after him meaning Muhammad, who's from Ishmael, will only serve to prepare the way for Mashiach's coming and the improvement of the entire world, motivating the nations to serve God together. As Tzfanya stated, Tzfanya is one of the prophets in the Tanakh, I will transform the peoples to a purer language that they will call upon the name of God and serve him with one purpose. How will this come about? The entire world has already become filled with the mention of Mashiach, Torah, and Mitzvot. These matters have been spread to the furthermost islands of many stubborn-hearted nations. They discussed these matters and the mitzvot of the Torah, saying these mitzvot were true, but were already negated in the present age and are not applicable. Others say, implied in the mitzvot are hidden concepts that cannot be understood. The Mashiach has already come and revealed those truths. When the true messianic king will arise and prove successful, his position becoming exalted and uplifted, they will all return, return and realize that their ancestors endowed them with a false heritage and their prophets and ancestors caused them to err. So what he's saying is the purpose of Christianity and Islam was to spread all over the world basic Torah concepts, to spread monotheism, to spread no, the notion of mitzvot, of reward and punishment, heaven, hell, retribution, resurrection, these core ideas that now, thanks to Christianity and Islam, the whole world is aware of them. That was the purpose. The Rambam. The Rambam wrote in the Mishnah Torah that this was the ultimate purpose of Christianity and Islam, to spread basic Torah ideas to the whole world. So now Christians know what mitzvot are, they know the Ten Commandments, Muslims know mitzvot, they don't eat pork, they, don't, they, circum I mean, they do circumcision, they're already part way there. So the world is already familiar with the notion of the Word of God, the Law of God, the Messiah, and so on. And when Mashiach will come, then all the nations, they're already almost there. So they're going to realize that their ancestors endowed them with a false heritage. And, but they're already almost there. So it's going to be very quick to move them to the true faith when Mashiach does come. That's the, they will recognize the truth very quickly because they already have learned all the fundamentals. That's what the Rambam says. That was the point of Christianity and Islam. Okay. 
And so on that note, just to point out that Islam has spread many Torah mitzvahs already, like we said with the pork and the circumcision, but also what are the five, anybody know what the five pillars of Islam are? Like the, it's, this is kind of like the 10 commandments of Islam, but the five main commandments of Islam, you know what they are? So one, the first is a shahada, which is reciting their affirmation that there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet, okay? Then the second one is salat. What does salat mean? Salat. <laughs> what does salat mean in Aramaic? You know, we say, Kaddish titkabal, titkabal tzlahotehon, uveotehon. What does it mean? Close, close, close. So in Aramaic, tzalat, tzalat, really, tzalat, we say tzalat, but it literally means prayer, that's all. The, in Hebrew, it's tefillah. In Aramaic, salat is prayer. So it's with a tzadi, tzadi. But remember, tzadi, we mentioned this briefly before. Tzadi is how Ashkenazim pronounced the letter. The letter is really supposed to be pronounced Saudi, which is how Sephardi communities always pronounced it. That's why Sephardis always say Sa, where it's Tsa instead, right? If you noticed in the prayers. So Tzlotehon is really Salotehon, because it's, it's a Saudi. Rav Sadia Gaon explains all the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And Rav Sadia Gaon, who was himself an Arabic Jew, he spoke Arabic, he wrote in Arabic, and so he explains that the Hebrew language is pure. Every Hebrew alphabet letter, each of the 22 letters, is one pure sound. It's a pure tone. None of the Hebrew letters can have a mix of two sounds. So tsa is not possible to be the authentic pronunciation, Rav Sadia Gaon says, because tsa is a combination of a T and an S, right? And Hebrew does not have combination sounds. It only has pure, every letter in Hebrew is a pure sound. So but then the, you end up with a sin. No, no, hold on. Sin is a pure sound. And a sadi. So they're all different. They're all different. They're all different. So this is a sadi, right? With a sa. It's a little different. So the Ashkenazi way was to pronounce it with a tsa, but the Sephardis always and the Mizrahi communities always pronounce it with a sa. And Arab, Arabs as well. So that's why the Arabic word for prayer, like the Aramaic word for prayer, is salat. So salat means prayer. Like Muslims pray five times a day. And where do they get praying five times a day from? There's... Well, they said the Jews do it three times. You got it together. <laughs> no, they did it because, because the Jews on their holiest day, on Yom Kippur, we pray five times, right? On a regular day, we pray three times. On Shabbat and holidays, we pray four times. And on Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year, we pray five times. And not only do we pray five times, we bow on Yom Kippur, remember? On Yom Kippur, there's a place where we actually go on our knees and bow. Yeah. And so Muslims got that prayer. Yeah, Muslims got the prayer from Jews on Yom Kippur. Meaning if the Jews on their holiest day pray five times right, and bow and go on their knees. So we'll do that every day five times. But, but, no, no, hold on. But, but Muslim prayers are much shorter, right? Like a Jewish prayer service is like could be an hour. Uh, but the Muslim prayer is much, much shorter. So five times a day, but it's a much quicker prayer. But ultimately, it comes from, from Yom Kippur. And you know, Muslims used to pray towards Jerusalem originally, before they prayed towards Mecca. So Salat is the second pillar of Islam, which means prayer. The third is Zakat. What does that sound like? Zakat, it's tzedakah, right? So giving to charity. Uh, and then the fourth is Psalm, which is Tzom. Tzom is fast. Again, Tzom is the Ashkenazi pronunciation. And psalm is the Sephardi and Arabic pronunciation, so to fast, Ramadan. And the fifth pillar of Islam is the Hajj, which again is a Hebrew word. It's the Chag. Uh, Chag is like the Chagim, the pilgrimage festivals that they used to have in biblical times. And for Muslims, the Hajj is a pilgrimage to Mecca. But it comes from the Hebrew word, the Chag, that the Jews used to go to pilgrimage to Jerusalem three times a year on Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot. And again, the, the, the Arabs pronounce the letter Gimel as a Gimel. That's why it's Hajj. And a camel instead of a Gamal is a Jamal. And the Yemenites, right, the Yemenite Jews, Taimani Jews, who generally pronounce the letters properly, except this one. Because the Taimanim, because of Arab influence, started to pronounce Ja as well. So Taimanim say, like, instead of Hag, they'll say Hajj, the traditional Taimani Jews. They pronounce Torah with a Gimel. And Rav Sadia Gaon said again that that's wrong. Why? Because ja is also not a pure sound. Ja is a combination of a da and a ja. Right? 
right? So like in Russian, if you want to write ja, you literally have to put a D and a ja together because ja is a D and a ja sound. So ja is not a pure sound. And so Rav Sadia Gaon says that that's not the right sound for the letter gimen. Tzadi is officially the Ashkenazi pronunciation. It should be a Saadi. Yeah. Okay, but we have a Tzadi, but we have a Saadi. That's how we put it. No, no, we call it Tzadi now because that's how Ashkenazim called it. But Sephardis always called it a Saadi. So oh. Sephardis don't say Itzhak, they say Ishak. And Arabs too. In Arabic, Itzhak is Ishak. Oh, it's just a matter of the sound. The, sound. Sound. the, sound. Like the letter is there. It's yeah. how you pronounce the letter. So yeah, so as a general rule, there's no Ja Hebrew Pure divine Hebrew has no ja and has no tsa and has no cha. And there's no cha sound because that's also a cha is a ta and a sha. It's like if you say teshuva, tshuva, the people say tshuva, bal tshuva, but it's not tshuva, it's teshuva. Yeah, so <laughs> that's the idea. Okay, let's finish. We talked about the fact that the Quran already says that Israel belongs to the Jewish people, that Officially, Al-Aqsa was not in Jerusalem. It was in Saudi Arabia. And we talked about before, and I'm not going to say it again, why Muslims had the Holy Land for 1,300 years. And I actually just posted that excerpt on YouTube. So if you forgot it, uh, like a 10-minute from the class that we did a few months ago. Why did Islam merit to hold on to Israel specifically for 1,300 years? There's a Zohar about that. So we can link to that later. And lastly... Okay. Uh, also, fun fact, you know, the Muslims took over Israel in the year 638. And, you know, the Jews actually welcomed them as liberators in 638 of the Common Era. And the caliph at the time, um, he actually brought 70 Jewish families from Tveria, from Tiberias to Jerusalem. And he cleared the Temple Mount and he built the Dome of the Rock on where the temple stood, where the Beit HaMikdash, where the Jewish temple stood. And the reason that he did that is, again, a Jewish advisor. His Jewish advisor, who was Kab al Akbar, who was a Jew, a Yemenite Jew, who became, who was converted to Islam. And he actually drew up the plans for the Dome of the Rock and told the Caliph to put it there, oh, wow. to preserve the site of the Jewish temple. The Byzantines turned it into a garbage dump, and so they cleared the temple. And in the year 614, if you remember, I mentioned this briefly, Nehemiah ben Hushiel led a revolt against the Byzantines and for a couple of years actually was able to have an independent Jewish state. And they started working on rebuilding the temple, but then the revolt got crushed. But it succeeded in weakening the Byzantine position in Israel, and that allowed the Muslims to take over very quickly. And then, so Kab advised the Caliph to put the Dome of the Rock there. And I've heard this said, I, apparently there is an inscription somewhere inside, or used to be, that said that the Muslims built the Dome of the Rock to preserve the holy site of the Jews, the King of Solomon's Temple, because this was the site of Solomon's Temple. So, but it was a, a Jew who gave him the plans to do it and, and, and who led that project. Okay, I'm going to finish with this and we're done. There's, we always want to go to prophecy. So there's one interesting prophecy from the Midrash, from Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, which says that Ishmael will do 15 things in Israel at the end of days. So the children of Ishmael will do 15 things in Israel. Remember, Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer is attributed to Rabbi Eliezer ben Hurkanus, Rabbi Eliezer the Great, who lived almost 2,000 years ago, before Islam. So it's talking about Ishmael, kind of like prophetically. In the future, Ishmael will conquer Israel, and 15 things they will do at the end of days. I'll read it in English just in the interest of time. It says they will do 15 things. They will measure the land with ropes. They will change a cemetery into a resting place for sheep and a dunghill. They will, they will measure with them um, and from them upon the tops of the mountains. Falsehood will multiply. Truth will be hidden. The statutes will be removed from Israel. Sins will be multiplied in Israel. Uh, worm crimson will be in the wool. And he will cover with insects paper and pen meaning literature will degenerate. He will hew down the rock of the kingdom and they will rebuild the desolated cities and sweep the ways and they will plant gardens and parks and fence in the broken walls of the temple and they will build a building in the holy place, okay, in the Eichal. And, and finally, two brothers will arise over them, princes at the end, and in their days the branch, meaning Tzemach, Mashiach ben David, will arise. And finally, 
the messianic age will begin. So there's a list of 15 things, most of which are really hard to understand. What does it mean they will measure the land with ropes? What is it really talking about? So historically, this was always understood in light of what happened in the 7th century when the Muslims first took over the Holy Land and did these things. They cleared the Temple Mount. They built a temple on... They built their shrine, the Dome of the Rock, on the temple. But Mashiach didn't come at that time and a lot of this didn't really take place. It's possible to interpret this as being what's happening right now. What's happening in our days, because if we're in the end of days, we do see this happening, where the land is being divided up parcel by parcel, all this arguing that Israel and the Palestinians have over tiny plots of land, especially in Judea and Samaria and the West Bank, and where they <clears throat> convert Jewish cemeteries into dung hills, and they've done that, if you know what the Waqf did, and they literally dug out truckloads of precious artifacts from the Temple Mount and dumped it in, literally in a garbage dump and destroyed Jewish cemeteries and dig them up and so on. So a lot of this actually we see happening today and having falsehood multiplying and no truth and people make up all kinds of false history about Israel and the Palestinians and so on. And in general, that there's very little truth in Israel today and all the lies from the media and so on. And so a lot of this stuff we see actually happening now. And when it says that the Ishmaelites will sweep the ways, plant gardens and parks, fence in broken walls, you know, if you know what's happening in Israel today, who are the people that do these jobs in Israel? Who are the gardeners in Israel and the maintenance people in Israel and the sweepers in Israel? They are the Ishmaelites, right? For better or for worse, it's many Arab Israelis that are doing these jobs in Israel. So I think you can very much interpret this as happening right now. And when the Midrash here says that they will build in the holy place, it says, uh, the exact wording in Hebrew is, ve'ivnu binyan be'echal. Okay, so it doesn't say that they're going to build a temple or a shrine. It just says they will build a binyan in the echal, in this kind of temple mount area. And, I mean, depending on how you define echal. And if you know recently, again, the, what the Muslim authority, the Waqf, is doing over there. In 2019, they started building a new mosque on the Temple Mount, another new mosque, which they're not allowed to do because there's supposed to be a status quo that nothing changes on the Temple Mount. But in 2019, they actually secretly started building a new mosque there. So it could very well be that this is what the Midrash was referring to because you can interpret all 15 of these things as happening right now and not necessarily in the 7th century. And finally, what's really interesting is the Midrash here quotes a verse in Daniel, which says that in the end of days, in those days, uh, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. An eternal kingdom. The Davidic dynasty will return. And the verse in Daniel, it's in Aramaic. Okay, And listen to how it ends. It says that, Yakim ela shmaya malchu dile almin, that God will raise up an everlasting dynasty, and the final words will not be destroyed is lotit chabal. And I just found that really amazing because what does that word mean today in modern Hebrew? Tit chabal. It's literally the same word as a mechabel in Hebrew is a terrorist. That's the word for terrorism. So it, there will no, it's like there will no longer be terrorism, lotit chabal, because that is the modern Hebrew word for terrorism. So I think you could very much uh, interpret this in light of what's happening today. And finally, and Rabbi Ishmael added, So in the end of days, the Ishmaelites, the Muslims, will start three major wars. Okay? In the end of days. And what are these wars? One will happen. Achat ba'ya'ar ba'arav. One in the forests in the wilderness of Arabia. So there will be a war in Arabia. Ve'achat ba'yam. And one will be a war at sea. Ve'achat bikrach gadol. And one will be a war against a major city. So three wars. One, a war in Arabia itself. One, a war at sea. And one, a war in a big city. So if you're following the politics that's happening today in terms of tension in the, in the Arab world itself and all the fighting in the Arab world and what's happening in the Persian Gulf and beefing up all the, these navies coming together. So it's in the sea, in Arabia, and against one major city. By the way, following 9-11 and during the war on terror, people often saw this prophecy as 
they thought 9-11 was this, that the, the war against a major city was the attack on New York City, and the war in Arabia was the subsequent war in Iraq and perhaps Afghanistan, and the war in the sea, what was happening in the Persian Gulf. So some people saw the, the war 9-11 and the war on terror as a fulfillment of this prophecy, but it hasn't happened yet because it says that during this time, when this war will happen, umisham ben David itzmach, from this conflict, this three-part war, Mashiach ben David will come, and he will see that the, he will defeat both, all the sides, umisham yavola eretz Israel, and then he will come to Israel from where? From Edom. Because the Pasuk Isaiah says, Mize bame Edom, that Mashiach is coming from the Western world to Israel. So the Mashiach is coming from the West. That's in many places, but Isaiah says this. Isaiah says, Mize bame Edom, that Mashiach is coming from the Western world, from Edom. And then he will come to Israel. I think this is why the Lubavitcher Rebbe never went to Israel. There's a classic question. Why did the Lubavitcher Rebbe never go to Israel? And I think this is why, because he knew this prophecy. The Mashiach is supposed to come from a major Western city, from Edom to Israel, triumphant as the Messiah. And I think the Lubavitcher Rebbe never went to Israel because he was waiting until he would be revealed as the Messiah. And then he could come to Israel triumphantly in fulfillment of this prophecy. Because he was from a major Western city, you know, the capital of the Western world, the Kach Gadon. So I think that's... that's he, never Israel. he never even visited Israel. He never stepped foot in Israel. So it's a classic question, why did the Lubavitch Rebbe never come to Israel? And they give different explanations, but I think this is, in my opinion, I think this is, the, this is why. Where is he was born? He was born in Ukraine. Yeah. But then he moved to Germany and then to France, Paris, and then to the United States. And he never left. Once he came to New York, he never left New York. Never. Not even on a vacation. Yes. Okay, let's end on a positive note. Last sentence. To end on a positive note, it says, you know, Ishmael is the forefather of Arabia, of the Muslim world. And the Torah speaks about him as, as a difficult person, as a pere adam, as, you know, as a wild and difficult person. However, Chazal tell us, our sages tell us that he died righteous that ultimately his end was righteous because the verse in Genesis says, These are the, the, the life of Ishmael was, He lived 137 years. Now, 137 already is an important number in Judaism because, and many people live to that, num- to that age, including Levi, including Amram, and it's the gematria of Kabbalah, I remember. So 137 is an important number, and Ishmael lived till he was 137, and then it says, Ve'igva vayamot, that he passed away and died. Ve'igva. And Rashi over there says, what is Ve'igva? That the word Ve'igva lo ne'emra gviya ela betzadikim. That only tzadikim have a gviya, ve'igva, that they pass on. So that teaches us that Ishmael, although he had, Ishmael was a sinner at some point and had a very difficult life, but ultimately he did teshuva and he was righteous and he died a righteous man. So I think you can learn from that, that ultimately Ishmael will be redeemed. You know, kind of like what the Rambam said, that they played an important role in world history, uh, played a significant role in the divine plan of spreading basic Torah ideas, monotheism and so forth to the whole world. And although it has been a difficult history, I think ultimately, like Ishmael, their, Ishmael, their forefather, it'll have a good conclusion and there will be a redemption at the end. So everything will be good at the end.